we started, uh, you don't have uh, back there the series of the <laughs> brochures that we have go from September through December, so we don't have the ones for the previous part of the year. But at the beginning of the year, we started a series of uh, talks that began with a Tibetan teacher named Sankapa in the 14th century who, among other things, um, began the Dalai Lama tradition, which he said would last for seven centuries. Uh, this is the seventh. And he also took it upon himself to, in the 14th century, um, send somebody, some enlightened being, to the West in the last quarter of every century for seven centuries. Um, those of you familiar with Buddhist terminology, uh, basically what we're talking about is um, a bodhisattva, an enlightened being, um, willing to be born in the West uh, in the last quarter of each century for seven centuries, again this being the seventh. So what we've been talking about, subsequent to the Sankapa lecture, is some of these beings that came to the West in the last 25 years of each century uh, in order to bring some light back into the West which had lost it. In the 14th century when Sankapa initiated this series of what have been called impulsions, um, all that was happening in the West was something called the Dark Ages. Uh, the teachings of uh, the timeless teachings of humanity had been wiped out in the third century by the church. Uh, people were being told that they only lived once and that their fate would be determined by um, some god who was watching them and keeping score. And at the end of the one life they had, they'd go to heaven or, or not. And if you weren't sure whether you're going to heaven, you could buy your way in by buying something called an indulgence. Um, the people are, were ignorant and afraid. And the church lived more palatially than any of the rulers in Europe. And uh, Sankapa in far off Tibet was aware of all this and started sending people in the last quarter of each century to bring the light back to the West, which had been brought to the West by Pythagoras, and again by Plato, both of whose teachings had been um, wiped out and anathematized, which means made a mortal sin to believe or teach, uh, by the church in the third century. So there wasn't any light in uh, Europe, and we've talked about this. we've talked about several of these people already. This is uh, called karma. Uh, <laughs> uh, we've talked about several of these people already, and we've gotten up. The last one we talked about was a man named. Oh, another thing I just want to say, which has been said before, but some of you haven't been here before is that most of these people who appeared in the last quarter of each century, starting in the 14th century, uh, you will not find in your history books, even if you're a history major. So they've been, with the exception of Arnold Toynbee, who's regarded as the greatest 20th century historian, and, um, and uh, uh, one of the Huxleys, um, with those two exceptions, these, these figures have been ignored and pretty much dis, um, dispensed with. If you look them up on the internet, most of what you will find is negative. Uh, they were slandered and the slander did survive. Um, those of you familiar with Plato's Allegory of the Cave or Jonathan Livingston Siegel book know that uh, those who got out of Plato's cave into the real world and decided to go back into the cave where the prisoners took shadows for realities, 
were scoffed and scorned and often killed. Uh, so that's what's happened to most of these people we're talking about. Uh, Cagliostro is the last one we talked about. He was in the 18th century. Um, there are actually five of these people who showed up in the 18th century. Um, Cagliostro was one. The one we're talking about tonight was another. Um, uh, Saint Germain, S A I N T M A R T I N. Um, Mesmer, of whom some of you may have heard. A man named um, Saint Germain and Thomas Paine, of whom some of you have probably heard. Um, so tonight they all they all appeared in the 18th century. And those of you who know a little history know that the 18th century is kind of pivotal in Western thought because as a result of what much of what happened in the 18th century, we have something called republics existing rather than monarchies. Um, there's more light in the West than there's been since the third century AD. And uh, it's on the internet now, so it's going to be impossible to put the fire out this time, as was done in the third century AD. Um, so Saint Martin, um, he's born in France in 1743. Um, to a relatively wealthy family. Uh, very little is known of his childhood. His father was an attorney and wanted him to be an attorney. So he studied the law and, start, and started practicing the law at the age of about uh, 21. And it turned out that he couldn't distinguish um, between the plaintiff and the uh, prosecution's cases. They both seem to be, have very little to do with truth and quite a bit to do with who is how clever. Um, and he was more interested in what justice really is than how it um, is practiced in the legal system. So he told his father he was not going to continue being a lawyer. And he asked his father to get him a position uh, in the military. Um, and there were no wars going on at the time. So he knew if he could get a position in the military, he would have time to study philosophy, which is what he wanted to do. So his father got him a position in the military by contacting, through the contacting the prime minister of France who just kind of gave him a officer's position in the military. And he ended up being stationed in uh, Bordeaux. He's about 22 at this point. There wasn't a lot happening militarily. So he had a lot of time on his hands. So he started checking out what was happening in Bordeaux, other than the military garrison. And he met a man named Pascalus. And Pascalus had traveled widely in the Far East. He was Portuguese. And he traveled widely in the Far East. And he was an initiate into the Kabbalah, which is Jewish mysticism. And he was initiate into um, Rosicrucianism. And he'd founded a Masonic order in Paris. But he'd also founded a quote unquote occult school, which in the days of ancient Greece would have been called a mystery school. He founded an occult school in Bordeaux. So Saint Germain joined Pascal's uh, occult school in Bordeaux. And the teachings in the school were. Um, pretty much secret, but they had to do with the, what might be called the wisdom of the ages. Um, they stressed the importance of um, moral purification prior to the cultivation of any spiritual powers. 
and Saint Germain's uh, Saint Martin's seriousness of purpose and his devotion to the teacher was such that he resigned his military post altogether and decided to spend his whole life studying what was being taught in this school. And after a few years, his teacher, Pascalis, for some reason unknown, had to go to the West Indies. And San Martin was made the head of the school. And he immediately tried to begin reforming it because people in the school, um, the purpose of which was to acquaint them with real spiritual knowledge and help them become better able to help and teach others. Um, most of the people in the school were interested in acquiring various occult and psychic powers. Um, this has happened in the last 25 years of every century since the 14th, including the 19th, including our own century, where the, most of the New Age is interested in acquiring various, or fascinated by various psychic phenomena and occult powers. So he spent some time trying to refound the school along the lines of what was called uh, original Eastern mysticism. And um, he started his own uh, secret Masonic rite in an effort to uh, purify masonry and bring it back to what it was, had been in the East where it was called something else. Um, it was called the Rectified Rite of San, Mar San Martin and the people who were in it came to be called Martinists. So if you ever come across the Martinists, that's the people that were in San Martin's, the first order he himself established. Um, in that same year, he wrote his first book, which was called On Truth and Error. And The book was basically, um, all of his books incidentally, he wrote eight books. They're all widely circulated. Um, most of them have not yet been translated into English. Some have. Um, but all of his books he wrote under a pseudonym. So n no one knew who'd written these books until after he'd passed away. And the reason he wrote them under a pseudonym is because the Inquisition still existed and the ideas he were expressing were condemned, had been already been condemned for centuries by the Inquisition. So if he'd put his name to the books, he would have been arrested or killed by the Inquisition. So all of his books were written under pseudonyms, um, weird pseudonyms. Um, uh, certain people knew, knew who wrote them. Um, Obviously, his pupils knew who wrote them. The first was called On Errors and, and Truth, and it was basic, basically a book outlining the dangers of, um, for people who are seeking some kind of spiritual um, knowledge. It was outlining the dangers of um, becoming fascinated by uh, various kinds of psychic phenomena, um, things like what we call today astral projection, uh, telepathy. He's warning of the dangers of all these things and how people who get caught up in them uh, are, in a, in a sense, digging their own spiritual graves. And they're also, in a certain sense, becoming potential menaces uh, to other human beings. So he stressed the importance of um, a firm moral foundation. And by, by a, form, uh, a firm moral foundation for those seeking spiritual knowledge, he didn't mean um, going to church and getting a bunch of things about do's and don'ts. <laughs> 
you know, I, what a moral person is. Um, some conceptions in your head of what it is to be moral. Um, by moral foundation, he meant um, the actual uh, regeneration of oneself in such a way that one was not a um, potential threat to others, and in such a way that to the extent that one did learn anything, um, one only used it to benefit others, never for one's own benefit. Um, so this would involve um, basically self-purification and gradually um, somehow or another uh, removing one's allegiance from uh, the phenomena of this world because as long as a person's consciousness is primarily concerned with the phenomena of this world, uh, they won't be able to practice any firm uh, spiritual mor morality because they'll have an interest in the phenomena of this world based upon their likes and dislikes. So they'll be making distinctions and Basically, what will happen is they'll become <laughs> pragmatists and they'll do what they have to do to get whatever it is they want out of this world. Um, and we see evidence of this all around us. So that was the first prerequisite of some kind of moral purification. Um, part of what this involved, he said, is um, And he actually had students, so he taught people this. Um, part of what this involves is actually looking at oneself, taking a look at oneself. Um, not who one thinks one is, and not who other people think one is, but just take a look at oneself um, as objectively as possible. And having taken a look, notice all the things that are standing in the way of one's awareness of the light. He said that the ultimate reality of things is uh, light. It's in the heart of every human being. It's also universally diffused. It's intelligent, which physics has yet to discover. Physics has discovered that light's universally diffused, but they don't know it's intelligent. And it's, it's the ultimate reality of things. And every human being experiences it in him or herself as themselves. Um, so whatever is between me and the light has to be dealt with. And a lot of what's between me and the light, he says, is my uh, sufferings, uh, my conditions, um, the things in my life that aren't the way I would like them to be. Like, how did I end up here? Why is this happening to me? Uh, whatever. You know. So he taught his students um, that you should look at your sufferings, he told them, as blessings. <coughs> look at your sufferings as blessings. This is based upon the acceptance, acceptance of the proposition, uh, which none of you have to accept, but this is what he taught. Uh, once a person accepts the proposition that everything that comes into their life is precisely what, what they have due to them, based upon past causes that they've made, otherwise known as karma, which is called an unerring law in the universe. So if a person can accept, and it's not easy to do this, that everything that's coming into my life is due to me, is my due. We're all getting our due at every moment. So rather than fighting it or being angry about it or let alone blaming it on somebody else, <laughs> 
like if it wasn't for so-and-so, this wouldn't be happening to me. That, all that kind of the games we play to keep ourselves from moving forward. Um, so he says to his pupils, you must count your misfortunes and sufferings as blessings. Um, and he says the first duty of man is to cease complaining. Very simple. The first duty of man is to cease complaining. He says this is relatively easy to do if you accept the proposition that everything that comes into your life is your due. So there's nothing to complain about. You're, Jesus said it, as you sow, so shall you reap. So whatever comes into your life is what you're reaping, and it's a direct result of what you've sown. Um, so these are opportunities. My sufferings are opportunities. Um, my duty is not to complain. Man's first duty. Um, as some people would say, uh, get off the pity pot. You know. So what do I do if I have some suffering? You know, and, I, and I've been taught that somehow or another, this is my due. Uh, so I, complaining isn't, if I start complaining, I'm, I'm not going to have very much more to do with somebody like Saint Martin. Um, if you want to complain, you, you don't do it in the mystery school. Um, you can go outside and complain. You can find lots of people that will complain right along with you. And you can all decide who's causing it. And it certainly isn't you. It's them. You know. And you have to drop all that stuff when you enter one of his schools. So well, let's say I've got something, I have some form of suffering going on in my life. And I have the courage uh, not to complain about it. Uh, so what should I do with it? What he says to do with it, he says the form your suffering's taking gives you, has within it the clue as to what cost it. So what he says you do, and this might involve some form of meditation, or at least quiet contemplation, what he says you do is you take the form of suffering that you're experiencing, which contains the kernel of what caused it, and you trace it back. You trace it back, you know, point by point by point, until he says you get to the principle that was violated, which is causing your suffering that violation. Um, at some point in time, you uh, didn't act in, an, in accordance with your true nature, uh, according to San Martin. So his first uh, book is a warning to avoid all the, what's sometimes called the astral realm. Um, just focus more on your own circumstances. Uh, don't complain and try to trace it back and see if you can find the principle that was violated. And man's second duty, having ceased complaining mm -hmm. and tried to, trying to trace this thing back, which might take years, you know. Um, Man's second duty, he says, is to go straight forward, turning neither to the left nor to the right. And he says, if you go straight forward and turn neither to the left nor to the right, you will regain the state you lost when you went off track back there to where you traced yourself back. So you get back to where you went off on a sidetrack, you get back to that by going straight ahead and going neither to the left nor to the right, which Buddha called the middle way. Yeah. Kierkegaard, the philosopher Kierkegaard, who we're actually going to be talking about in a couple months, he talked about people going into a parenthesis. He says, your life's going along, and then you, get, you, get, you go off on some trip. We, we'd call it a trip 
he called it a parenthesis. You, you get into some parenthesis. And then at some point, you come out of the parenthesis, and you realize that you're exactly at the point you were at when you went into it. <laughs> no progress has been made at all. You just spent a bunch of time in a parenthesis. Um, and Kierkegaard, who had a very good sense of humor, Kierkegaard makes the comment that some people have been known to live their entire life in a parenthesis. <laughs> which means nothing really happened, <laughs> in spite of the fact that they were, no doubt, thinking a great many things were occurring. <laughs> um, so basically what San Germán is saying is that by, by going straight ahead and not veering to the left or to the right, one can um, get back to the point where one went off and continue on. So you don't get back to where you left off by going backward. You get back to where you left off by going forward. Um, but that's only after having traced the thing back. And that can only happen when I've ceased complaining. Could you define going forward? Uh, going forward would have to do with um, whatever teachings you've been given. Uh, implement them to the best of your ability. And when you... Um, fail uh, to some degree to implement them uh, rather than rationalizing your failure, get right back on track again. Keep going forward. You, know. you go back uh, basically through trying to trace causes. Like, okay, what could have caused this condition? And then it's not easy, but you just have to try to go back, you know, try to go back. What something led, some set of causes led to this form of suffering I'm experiencing. It's not easy to do. It, you know, it might take a long time, and it, one might fail to do it, but the attempt itself is worthy because at least one's accepting responsibility for one's situation even if one doesn't have the ability, perhaps, to trace it back to its ultimate cause. Um, at least one's not putting the blame on others for one's, situa one's sufferings. Um, he traveled a great deal. Um, he went to England to, uh, because he was, he'd heard about a woman named Jane Lead who was a mystic and had written a number of books. So he went to England to study the writings of Jane Lead and also to study the commentary on a mystic called Jacob Burma, B-H-O-E-M-E. -E. Uh, Englishmen had written com extensive commentaries on the philosophy, the mystical philosophy of this Burma. So he went, went to England to study the accounts, the explanations of Burma's philosophy, and to study the writings of this <coughs> female mystic called Jane Lead. And while in England, he met a group of uh, Russian Im immigrants who, who had their own mystical society going. And they were all connected with something called uh, Cagliostro, for those of you who are here for that lecture. Cagliostro's quote unquote, northern school, uh, which was the aspect of Cagliostro school that was involved most with teaching the occult side of nature and of man, and also taught, explicitly taught reincarnation. Um, some Artain didn't explicitly teach it. He quite clearly um, taught the doctrine of karma, or the, put it simply, the doctrine of cause and effect. Uh, we live in a universe of cause and effect. There's no such thing as a, a random happening. There's no such thing as an uncaused event. Um, there's no such thing as a coincidence. Um, we live in a law-governed universe. Now, because we're, we're involved, he said, 
And he's just talking about, you know, humanity in his time and going back centuries. Um, because none, none of these things we've been talking about so far were, were being taught by the church, obviously. They're all being condemned by the church. Um, he said that the ultimate nature of reality is, um, is a, a living substance. He capitalized the S. And it's beyond human comprehension. And it's not a being. And everything flows from it. And he says, human beings have made the mistake. And, it, and it's, within, it's within everything, which means it's within us, this uh, eternal living substance. <laughs> And human beings, he says, have made the mistake of trying to understand uh, themselves by understanding nature. Whereas they should, he sa if they took a look at themselves, he said, they'd be, trying to they'd be attempting to understand nature through understanding themselves. Which is, o which is the only way nature will ever be understood, he said. So the key to uh, understanding the ultimate nature of reality, he said, is by going within. And in this sense, it's the same thing Jesus taught when he said the kingdom of God is within you, which the church had conveniently forgotten to mention for 1,100 years. Um, so he agreed, the kingdom of heaven is within, and he said the only way a human being can start moving spiritually is to go within and, and activate that, what he called spiritual essence within. Which means going in. Um, so why do we suffer? Because our attention is on the without. And when our attention is all out here, and when our desires and hopes and fears and ambitions and who we think we are has all got to do with out here, he says. Then the mind gets confused and, be, and falls into a state of disharmony, known by psychologists as conflict, inner conflict. You know, should I do this or this? Is this right or is this right? You know, conflict. Um, you don't find a lot of people walking around who are, have a, a, a deep abiding sense of peace because most people have a lot going on and a lot of it is conflictual. And this is, he says, because the attention is all being focused out here into the phenomenal world. He says it also disturbs the will. So the will gets in a state of disharmony. So I want this, but I also kind of want this, but I can't have them both, so what the hell should I do? Uh, may as well just say the universe is absurd. Um, so he says uh, evil, which fascinates many people. Uh, evil, he says, is a state of disharmony. Uh, created by attentiveness to the external world and putting one's um, search for meaning out here, which creates these internal conflicts in the mind and in the will. And that's what he defines as evil, is that disharmony within. Plato taught the same thing 500 BC. Pythagoras taught the same thing before that. The ancient sages in India and Tibet taught the same thing thousands of years before that. Evil is disharmony uh, within. Um, so anything that helps a human being move towards internal harmony is good. And anything that obstructs moving toward that internal harmony is evil. Evil. 
according to San Martin. But because evil is a state of disharmony, that presupposes a prior state of harmony. So the ultimate nature of things is harmonious. So in that sense, evil and good aren't equal. Um, now are not equal. Evil is a state of disharmony within something that in reality is harmonious. Um, so in that sense, evil is like, um, it can never defeat the good, but it, it can hinder its progress. But the, the will, if it can extricate itself from its um, conflicted likes and dislikes relative to the world, if, if the will can pull itself out of that by practicing, like five minutes a day, um, if the will can pull itself out of that and aim itself in the direction of universal unity, then it can gradually, um, through itself, through the will, it can gradually move itself toward a more conscious awareness of unity, of an, the actual unity that exists. Um, now, you might call it the harmony of nature. Um, if you know anything about astronomy, uh, it's pretty harmonious business going on. It's also incredibly precise, down to the millisecond. What's going on up there can be predicted down to the millisecond 10 years from now. And, it, and when that time comes, it'll, those things will be exactly where they're predicted to be. Because it's harmonious and it's intelligible. Um, he said the, um, one of his books has to do with the correlations between the different um, levels of being that affect um, quote unquote God, uh, which he conceived of as a unity, the ultimate unity, correlations that have to do with God, nature, and man. This was his second book. A set of, set of cor how, what correlates between us and nature and the ultimate unity? Because it's all one thing, but how does it correlate? How does your mind correlate with what? Your feelings correlate with what? And he says if the will, he says the only thing, no, it's, no put it positively, what we have that no other order of being on the earth has is a will, is a will, which we can direct. We may not be doing it, but we have the capacity to direct our will. That too, but we're talking about directing the will. He says all the other forms of life um, fulfill their function um, perfectly. But human beings are born with the ability to will themselves um, into disharmony and evil or towards harmony and light. And the, um, what's sometimes called the atavistic tendency, um, that means going back lifetimes. The atavistic tendency in most human beings is to will themselves in their interest in their life and their self-image and all the rest of it. The will is all got directed out into the world. So to take that will, which is a, like a, it's like a colorless force. To take that will and aim it toward universal unity, which might just be as simple as sitting down for five minutes a day and thinking about universal unity as a reality, even though it's not apparent. Um, and by starting to notice correlations between things and directing the will to understanding those correlations, which he says ultimately come down to understanding numbers, colors, and sounds. Numbers, colors, and sounds. And he says the most precise way 
to characterize the different levels of being and their correlations with one another is mathematical. But he says it's the most difficult way because it's the most precise. So basically what he's saying is the universe can be understood through number. And if any of you ever take the, um, just for the heck of it, take the interest in looking at the, uh, the Kabbalah, which San Martin's teacher was an initiate into the Kabbalah, which is Jewish mysticism. Um, in Hebrew, every uh, letter, the same is true of Sanskrit, but in Hebrew, every letter has a number that goes with it. Like the letter A we might have, have the number one, the letter B the number two, or whatever. So in the Hebrew alphabet, every letter has a number that corresponds to that letter. So if you're a Kabbalist, a Jewish mystic, initiate like San Martin's teacher was, and say you're reading the book of Genesis, which is a Hebrew text, um, and you're a, you're a Kabbalist, the first three words in the book of Genesis are in the beginning. So if you're a Kabbalist, you, you write those words down in Hebrew, then underneath each letter you put the number that goes with that letter. So you're going to have three sets of numbers, one corresponding to in, another set corresponding to the, another set corresponding to beginning. So you've got three sets of numbers. Then you, so to speak, erase the letters. And the meaning of that phrase has got to do with those, that combination of numbers. And they read the entire Old Testament that way. And that's got to do with the mysteries. And that's why it comes down to numbers, colors, and, form, and sound. So the entire universe can be understood mathematically. Physics has gone a long way in this direction. Um, let me read you just one thing. There might be a mathematician or two here. Um, He's saying um, co correlations, we're talking about making, being able to make correlations from this plane to some more subtle one. Correlations cannot be understood, can be understood mathematically, though this method is the most difficult because it is the most precise. Then San, San Martin says, just for those of you into numbers, the fall of man can be found in the movement from four to nine. The proportion of evil to good here below is numerically as 9 to 1, in intensity as 0 to 1, and in duration as 7 to 1. But the divine is not subject to calculation and is therefore ever unknowable. The divine is not subject to calculation and is therefore ever unknowable. Um, and then he talks about why the divine is not subject to calculation, which gets into um, pretty advanced mathematics. And uh, at one point in his life, he, um, he became interested in numbers and spent quite a long time studying them. And apparently one of his last uh, regrets as he was old and about to pass away that he hadn't had time to fully master the, what he called the science of numbers. Um, so anyway, he wrote the book with having to do with these correlations, and he said the, the more the will aims itself in the direction of, of unity, the more, the more conscious one can become aware of it. And the more consciously one becomes aware of unity, uh, which one will not become conscious of if one's consciousness is is totally tied up in the phenomenal world because it doesn't look like there's unity out here. 
but the more conscious one becomes of unity, he says, the more one will come to realize one's responsibility to nature and to man. Because if this unity is real, then we're all tied together whether we like it or not. And there's no actual distinction between nature and man. There's no distinction. Physics calls it a unified field. So even the distinction between nature and man is kind of an illusion. Um, animals um, cannot, through being in a state of disharmony, um, harm nature. But because human beings, and this, this is being written in the 18th century, before what we had, what we now call pollution, uh, he's saying that in the, in the 18th century that nature has become completely polluted because human beings have misuse, misused their powers by directing their selfishness out into the world. And this has made nature, as he puts it, groan in agony. And 200 years later, we're seeing the physical manifestations of the pollution that he saw on more subtle planes, the, what we've done to nature. And he says, the more a person becomes aware of the unity of things, um, the more the person will become conscious, as he said, of, of their responsibility to other human beings, but also to nature, and will actually ask nature's forgiveness and try to um, infuse into nature um, the help that only we can give it. And it's infused into nature through thought and through our speech. So some of you think, well, these these enlightened beings that sit around and on mountaintops meditate all the time, what good are they doing? Um, they're helping nature. He talks about um, the Word. You know, in the book of uh, John in the New Testament, it's only one of the four books in the New Testament that begins with the phrase, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. And that the Word that's getting translated as Word is the word Logos, L-O-G-O-S. And Samartan says that in the very heart of every being, human being, is this Word. And he said, in a certain sense, to be a human being is to be like a divine thought. And he says it's our, remember he's talking to people who are pretty serious. Um, he says it's, it's up to each person to uh, uncover within themselves this word. And having uncovered it, to live in accordance with it. And this will change all of their behavior. So then he talks the, about the importance. Well, having said that, he says that um, every thought, every feeling, every action, every word we speak, um, goes up through the different planes of uh, reality from this most homogeneous and gross one to the most refined ones. Every thought, feeling, action, deed, and word has its moral effect that goes up through all the different layers of being and imprints itself on what he calls the eternal mirror from which nothing can ever be erased. So if you want to know why 
people like Swedenborg and Nostradamus can uh, tell you about the past and the future is because it's already there on that mirror. The problem is if, if our actions and feelings and thoughts and words are negative and disharmonious, and that's what's getting impressed on this mirror, what's on this mirror reflects back down onto humanity. So people, psychologists don't know where thoughts come from or feelings. They come from the mirror unless you're actually in control of them yourself, um, which is rare. Um, so he says we've, this mirror is, is, uh, retains all the impressions of every human being's thoughts, feelings, emotions, and acts of speech. And of all of these, the one that's the most powerful is, uh, is speech, he says. Um, because it has to do with this word that's within the heart of every human being. So he says, through speech, we can align ourselves with the uh, harmonious and higher elements in, in reality. Or through speech, we can align ourselves with the lower, more demonic elements in reality. And our consciousness will reflect whatever we've aligned ourselves with. Primarily through speech. So he emphasizes, uh, he gave his students uh, rules for speech. Um, he gave his students rules for speech because even though it doesn't seem like it, it's our most potent um, faculty. So one of the rules, one of the rules was could be put in the put in terms of less is more. He says un unnecessary speech um, literally fritters away the powers of the soul. So someone who speaks a lot of unnecessary words is actually making themselves spiritually weaker, whether they're conscious of it or not. So sparing in speech, um, then he says what probably some of your mothers told you, but he doesn't put it quite like mom did. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Uh, he agrees, but he puts it even stronger. He says, we should re so, and so respect human intelligence, which every human being has, consciousness. We should so respect human t intelligence that our speech should be directed to that, the dignity of that intelligence. In our speech, he said, we, sh we should approach, he's telling his pupils this, he said, we should approach other human beings as certain wise personages in the East are approached uh, with great humility and conveying what little we know to them. Um, he says our, our speech should be about um, elevating, elevated matters. And he said, uh, he, he speaks of the need for self-regeneration, um, activating and acting out of that word within. He said the proof of our, of our regeneration lies in the fact that we regenerate those around us. So if somebody feels themselves to be spiritually regenerated and is having no effect on anybody around them, then they just think they're regenerated. Um, whereas if you run into someone who actually is, to whatever degree, it's, it's not all or nothing. If you run into someone who actually is self-regenerated, and to use his phrase, um, they light up everyone who comes in contact with them. A good example being the Dalai Lama. I mean, he walks into an auditorium of, you know, 25,000 people, and he, he walks in, and everybody feels this incredible peace come over them. So that's, that's kind of a large example of how regeneration 
uh, is contagious. Okay. He wrote another book where he talks about human beings um, in terms of uh, immortality. He says one's, one's uh, self-regeneration, um, the object of it initially is to realize one's own immortality, not believe in it, but actually become consciously immortal. And um, I don't know if some of you may know about Ramana Maharshi, who is a, one of the wisest beings in the 20th century, he lived in India. But he has a little book called Conscious Immortality, where he talks about what's involved in become consciously immortal, in becoming consciously immortal which means you're walking around in a human form, but you know you're mortal. You're never going to die. You're the body well, but that's not who you are. It's just something you're using. Um, so he says one of the first stages is to become consciously immortal. In order to do this, one has to regenerate oneself. In some of the ways we already talked about, but he says spiritual regeneration, the attempt at it, um, the sign that you're making progress is that you'll begin to experience pain. You'll begin to experience pain. And he gives the example of a person who's had an arm or a leg amputated and it's gone but they're still feeling the pain in it. He says when you attempt to start spiritually regenerating yourself, you're going to feel pain in the aspects of yourself that you've lost. And because of that pain, and some of you have experienced it perhaps to some degree, if you've tried to do something like concentrate for five minutes without wavering, or uh, meditate for five minutes without wavering, uh, it's painful because it doesn't happen, you know. It's just a <laughs> So it's kind of painful. Um, that would be kind of a minor example, but just pain. There's pain involved in moving toward the light because so much of us is used to living in the darkness. Um, so the parts of us that are comfortable in the darkness, which most people call light, uh, the parts of us that are comfortable in the darkness, if we start moving toward light, they're going to resist. And, and that, that's the pain he's talking about. In order to keep going at that, when that starts to occur, and not give up, because this is just too damn painful, it's not worth it, I think I'll just go have a couple beers <laughs> and talk about how rotten the world is <laughs> with a bunch of other people who are happy to, well, happy to talk about how rotten the world is. Uh, instead of do it, giving up, because there's some pain involved, he says, it's necessary to activate and cultivate what he calls the spiritual will. The spiritual will. Instead of wanting uh, what, we usually, what we want, and perhaps have wanted most of our lives, having to do with the body and its world, uh, we have to want um, to move toward the light. And if, if, if we can generate that will, which he calls the spiritual will, to move toward the light and hang on to it, then we'll be able to endure the pain of the parts of us that don't, that don't want to get left behind, that don't want to, don't want to have to let go. Because we're comfortable with our current state um, pretty much. So there'll be this resistance. And, um, so the spiritual will has to be cultivated. Um, 
he says that uh, there are those who, who are aware that nature sings, that nature has a song. Uh, so does the universe. Uh, Pythagoras called it the music of the spheres. Um, this is not necessarily literal. Um, so another way of looking at our task as human beings is to learn to sing along with nature. And we can't sing along with nature until we give up the parts of ourselves that don't want to sing, that want to complain instead. Remember that thing about rule number one, do, no complaining? <laughs> I can't sing if I'm complaining. He says that without, without this spiritual will, a person's view of life, they might start viewing human life as, here I am putting forth all this effort, even if it's worldly effort, and nothing's really happening, and if, if something does happen, I'm going to die anyway, and so what's the point of it all? Uh, so they get cynical and negative. Um, and a lot of this was going on in the time of Saint-Martin, which was the time of the French Revolution. Um, so he said, in order not to get drawn into that nihilism, that view that you live in an indifferent universe, and you're just going to live and die and there's nothing to it, um, the only way to get over that is to f engage the spiritual will, um, at least intellectually as a beginning, uh, think about the possibility that unity is what's really going on and that all the apparent disunity is because of our addiction to ph phenomena. And he doesn't think, uh, Saint Martin, that suddenly humanity is going to wake up and start moving toward the light. Um, but what he did think was that he could get some people going during a period that was incredibly dark and in which none of these ideas were available. So he made them available. He wrote eight books. Uh, when he, was, he died at 60. Uh, when he was 55, um, the church found out who was writing these books and uh, found one of them to be heresy and uh, put out their, what do you call it? Uh, they put out a, well, they put out a deal to find this guy and arrest him so we can kill him. The Inquisition, yeah. The Inquisition, yeah, all points, all points bulletin. The Inquisition was still happening. So when he was 55, they found out who was writing these books, and they found one of them to be heresy. Furthermore, um, Rosicrucianism, Masonry, uh, if you are found to be involved with either one of those, um, you're subject to death. Um, so they, all, they were all secret societies. And, um, so he wrote his last book, and uh, it's the one where according to one um, Masonic writer in the 20th century, who's kind of an expert on the whole history of that thing, uh, his last book apparently showed in detail um, the laws that govern uh, the ultimate nature, the laws that govern the universe, the laws that govern human beings, the laws that govern uh, every aspect of things. And, um, and he, he brought to bear uh, ancient teachings as evidence that these things have all been taught before. He mentioned Pythagoras and Plato, which you've already mentioned, who taught all these same things. 
but were wiped out in the third century AD by the church. But he also said, interestingly enough, just to give you one quote here, about look, the answer is inside, not outside. He says, to a, writing to a friend, he said, I will not conceal from you that formerly I walked in this external way, living out here in the world. Nevertheless, I at all times felt so strong an inclination to the intimate secret way that the external way never further seduced me, even in my youth. For at the age of 23, I had been initiated in all these things. So at 23 years old, he was already a, what Plato called an initiate. And um, in his last book, he, he laid out as big a picture as he could. And on his deathbed, he said, um, the seeds I've sown will bear fruit. Um, he also said toward the end of his life, the ideas that the West has, has uh, held in contempt for centuries, referring primarily to the church, um, will make them, are going to make them their way back into the West. And he made specific reference to the uh, Mahabharata, um, which is one of the oldest and longest texts in ancient India. He, ma he made reference to the Vedas. And he made reference to the Bhagavad Gita, which had already been translated in his own lifetime into French, first translation in the West. And he said, all of these ideas are going to come back, having been in Plato and Pythagoras, they're all going to come back and be available and help people once again move toward, help humanity once again move toward the light. But he said, None of them will do anybody any good until they take them and use them to look within. So what he's saying is you can study the Mahabharata, you can study the Vedas, you can study the Bhagavad Gita. It won't do you any good unless you take that as the train, so to speak, for your inner journey. So as they say in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, it's an inside job. And uh, he also said that um, if a person's seeking uh, the spiritual life, they need to do it, he said, in a spirit of self-renunciation and sacrifice. Because if they don't do it in a spirit of self-renunciation and sacrifice, they're affinities to certain things out here in the world will continue to dog them. Because they'll still have certain things that they kind of are hanging on to. It's very difficult to overcome that. Those tendrils that we've put out into this thing, maybe since we were little children. It's very difficult to, it's like taking a peach and pulling out all those little tendrils that run all the way through it. So it's not, a, he didn't say it was easy, but he said any, he had hope for uh, humanity, which all the great teachers have. Um, he said the uh, human destiny is to, um, he used the word remember, why we're here. It's interesting that Plato said the precise same thing. Plato said knowledge to know is to remember. And Saint Martin said um, our purpose here is to remember the high mission with which we came in and which we lost sight of when we became uh, fascinated by the phenomenal world. Yeah, renunciation for him basically meant that if I'm attempting to pursue the inner life and um, renunciation involves uh, 
to put it the way Samartan puts it, um, I'm, I'm pursuing the inner life. I'm trying to trace these things back. Uh, I'm trying not to complain. I'm trying to go straight ahead. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm doing, I've renounced in the sense that I'm not, I'm not doing these things so that I can achieve some result. So I've, I've renounced my own spiritual progress, so to speak. I'm not doing it so I can progress. Because the I who wants to progress is basically what's standing between me and the light. Um, and that's where these correlations come in and where, where aiming the will at universal unity comes in. If a person starts moving the will and actually experiencing some, some level of unity, part of what that unity involves is lack of separation. And part of what lack of separation involves is no me, as, as distinguished from you. Um, so renunciation has to do with giving up giving up any hope of a personal, to use Christian language, a personal salvation. In uh, one of the schools he founded, which was also founded in the 14th century by Sankapa, who at one point in his life called a gathering of, of all the initiates on the planet to Tibet, not necessarily in their physical forms. And he, he started a school, Sankapa, capital S. And part of the admittance to that school was uh, to say, to, uh, to Sankapa in this case, um, that your motive for entering the school was solely so that you would be better able to help and teach others. It wasn't about yourself. It's like, I want to learn this so I can pass what little, whatever little I learn, I want to learn it so I can pass it on. Not so I can be, you know, cool and spiritual. Um, okay, there are a couple more things I'd like to mention. For those of you into mysticism, um, these five, five people in the 18th century who were all quote unquote bodhisattvas, but none of them said they were, um, four of them were members of a, of a brotherhood called the Brothers of Light, which you can look up on the internet. And all of them were Masons. Only Tom Paine wasn't a member of the Brothers of Light, but all of them were Masons. You probably know that all the signers of the Declaration of Independence were Masons. Um, basically, mason, masonry is what carried the thread through the Dark Ages. But it had to be secret, uh, but it, wor it worked. Because uh, now these ideas are all over the place. Now, you, we may not like them or believe in them or accept them, but they're all over the place. They're all over the internet. So uh, the third century wiping them all out cannot happen today. You can't wipe them out. It's too late to wipe it out. So we're living in an interesting time that way. Uh, I just wanted to read you a couple things. He says, back to numbers. Numbers are the only sensible expression of the different properties of beings which all proceed from the one and only essence. And then he says the number seven is the ruling number of the manifested universe. And a woman named Blavatsky, about whom we'll be talking, who, who was the 19th century version of these five people in the 18th, she talked so much about the number seven in terms of planes of reality and colors in the rainbow and layers of the skin and openings in the human head. I mean, you get these sevens all over the place. And she, she, she referred to herself and her pupils as the seven lunatics. Yeah. 
Okay. In his last book, he said, in the introduction, he says this, A zeal for the repose of the whole human family masters and consumes me. I can neither evade nor resist it. It torments me continually. How can I make man listen to me? Principles are all I have to offer them. I would animate them with a glorious desire to renew their alliance with universal unity. But they are in arms against that unity and seem as if they wish to efface its very existence. He wrote that shortly before his death. Well, it's Then last, lastly, we'll end on this. The control of speech is one of the prime requisites for the spiritual life. As our speech becomes deliberate, instigated and controlled by the word within, an inner alchemy is worked, whereby passion is transmuted into compassion, lust into love, antipathy into sympathy. San Martin gives us a simple standard of life, which, if faithfully followed, will bring about our regeneration and restore us to the human dignity we have lost. And this is quite famous, but I'll read it to you. Um, simple standard of life, this is it. And he wrote this almost as he was dying. Not a desire, but in obedience not an idea which is not a sacred communication, not a word which is not a sovereign decree, not an act which is not a development and extension of the vivifying power of the word. Then he says, lose not a moment in reviving within you all these measures, if you have allowed them to die. Make these powers, each in its class, always advance for this is the way of justice. And unlike some of his fellows in the 18th century, he, he uh, went back to his village and uh, passed away quietly. And, uh, he only became known after his death, pretty much, because all of his things were, as I said, written anonymously. Um, on two occasions, he went to Masonic conventions where he and Cagliostro and Mesmer and Saint Germain and Payne were all together at the same time. Um, so they knew each other. And, uh, and another one who hung out with them um, and was in some of the same mystical societies as they were was Mozart. You know, so it's quite an interesting period there in the 18th century. And as, when we get to Saint Germain, we'll see the he was more on the political side of the whole thing, and um, responsible for the fact that we now have republics instead of monarchies, including this republic. Yeah. So next time uh, we're alternating people with concepts. So this was a people talk. The next uh, second of uh, September will be a talk called Elementals which is unfamiliar notion to most of us probably, but it's got to do with, um, for example, what are thoughts made of? Where do they come from? What controls them? You know, way beyond anything modern psychology is onto yet, except for the CIA who's get a little bit onto it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, thank you for coming. Thank you. Yeah.